Today we're talking about the Supreme Court, a book club for the Constitution. So what did you think the authors meant when they wrote Article 2? Supreme Court precedent has been around for about as long as America has, and unless they get overturned, they just sort of linger on the books. Heck, we only overturned the ruling that said you could lock up Japanese people in internment camps two years ago, in the same decision where the court approved the Muslim ban. Progress? I mention this because the case we're talking about today comes from the year 1905. Yeah, not a ton of clips to cut to in this episode. The question facing the court was, could the state government violate certain civil liberties, in this case a mandatory smallpox vaccination, in the face of a coming public health pandemic? To really hammer home the relevance of this case, in case you haven't connected the dots yet, this case's precedent is currently being cited across the country to all sorts of touch of civil rights violation cases, from a temporary ban on abortions to forcing orthodox Jewish communities to get measles vaccinations. Now this ruling is about to take center stage as the Supreme Court is set to hear a case applying this precedent for a pandemic era abortion ban. With that, let's head back to 1905. Congratulations to Teddy Roosevelt starting his first term in office. Who would have guessed that the anti-monopoly man would look so much like the monopoly man's depressed brother. The Wright brothers just got a plane to stay in the air for 30 seconds. Man, if they can perfect that whole flying thing, talk about an industry that could never fail. In local news, we go to Massachusetts where Henning Jacobson is refusing to get a mandatory vaccine. He will be fined $5 for refusing to comply with the state mandate unless the Supreme Court rules in his favor. That's right, during the height of a smallpox scourge that we can all safely blame on the dirty Italians by the way, someone is refusing a vaccine on the grounds of constitutionality. So what's going on? Well first I need to give you viewers a little context, because to your modern sensibilities, dumping on anti-vaxxers might seem pretty controversial. Back in the heyday of the vaccine though, those people were universally considered to be gooks. Newspapers sided with the state calling anti-vaxxers ignorant barbarians and hopeless cranks. The debate amounted to a conflict between intelligence and ignorance. Civilization and barbarism reported the press. He initially tried to make an argument that the vaccine was unhealthy, but yeah, that argument got laughed right out of the court. His evidence was discarded on the grounds of incompetence and immateriality. I mention all this because while today anti-vaxxers have quite the platform, Back in 1905, this would be legally seen kind of like someone suing for the right to not wash their hands, or cough openly on public transit. Hey, it's a free country. So first, let's hear from the man refusing to get his vaccine. His argument was essentially, my body, my choice. He argued mandatory vaccinations were hostile to the inherent right of every free man to care for his own body and health in such a way as to him seems best, and that the execution of a law against one who objects to vaccination, no matter for what reason, is nothing short of an assault upon his person. Let's keep government regulation away from what I choose to do to my body. If I don't want to get a vaccine for any reason, even if I'm just scared of a shot, I should not be required to get one. This right, he argued, was defended by the 14th Amendment, an amendment that at the time was pretty hot off the presses, guaranteeing life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness to everyone, including African Americans, and ending slavery. So to quote the decision, is this statute inconsistent with the liberty which the Constitution of the United States secures to every person against deprivation by the state? Short answer, no. Long answer, and wow, that is a very long answer. Sorry about that. There is a sphere within which the individual may assert the supremacy of his own will and rightfully dispute the authority of any human government. But 
It is equally true that in every well-ordered society charged with the duty of conserving the safety of its members, the rights of the individual in respect of its liberty may, at times under pressure of great dangers, be subjected to such restraint, to be enforced by reasonable regulations, as the safety of the general public may demand. So that sounds alarmingly close to a blank check for states. Yeah, we decided to stop doing elections for eh, public health. Can states do that? Well, it depends on how good your lawyer is. Two questions had to be answered yes for this mandatory vaccine to be considered legal. Whether the safety of the public justified this particular restriction and whether it was enforceable by reasonable regulations. The first question was pretty obvious. Uh, infectious diseases were the leading cause of death in America and we have a vaccine. Figure it out. The second question was a bit trickier though. Was this reasonable? The court found that the vaccination was a reasonable strategy for controlling a virus and that a blanket mandatory vaccination was not arbitrary or oppressive. They did carve out an obvious exception for anyone with a doctor's note saying that the vaccine could harm their health, although the court ruled that Jacobson didn't qualify for this. In the end, he ended up paying the $5 fine and remaining unvaccinated. Well, that was a waste of time. So now let's take that precedent and apply it to abortion in Texas during the coronavirus. So what Texas argues is that we are in the middle of a global pandemic of a size that we have not ever seen in modern times. So of course, by regulating abortion, they argue very succinctly that they are trying to improve the safety of their constituents. Now, the second idea, and this is you know one that the courts have really uh, nailed in on, is the idea that government uh, power during a global pandemic, during a emergency state, allows for certain constitutional rights to be curtailed. So between those two, that is what Texas's argument is for levying a, a near total ban on the procedure right now. Much like the vaccination case, if you can prove that the abortion is designed to save your life, you can still get one. But besides that, the procedure is banned. This brings us to the same two questions we just had to answer whether the safety of the public justified this particular restriction, and whether it was enforceable by reasonable regulations. Both of these questions are a little trickier here though, because first, how does banning abortions help fight the coronavirus? On March 22nd, Texas's Republican Governor Greg Abbott issued an executive order barring all medical procedures that are not immediately medically necessary in order to save hospital beds and protective gear like masks and gloves for COVID-19 patients. That includes abortions that are not medically necessary. Well, that sounds reasonable. Is it reasonable? Well, first, that's not really up to me as a YouTube commenter to decide. Ask a judge. There are some compelling arguments for why it might not be reasonable, though. First, pro-choice groups are being very specific with their demands. Pointing to hundreds of women whose appointments have already been canceled, the plaintiffs asked the court to lift Texas's ban on pill-based termination during the first 10 weeks of pregnancy. Yes, the push is to make abortions that require no medical operations to continue to be legal because, well, that doesn't obstruct the overall goal of freeing up medical supplies. Except of course if maybe the doctor is wearing a glove when he hands you that bottle of pills. Similarly, and this might seem a little counterintuitive at first, but they're also pushing for this rule to not cover surgical abortions for women nearing 22 weeks of gestation. Now that took me putting on my thinking cap for a second, but then I realized that 22 weeks is the cutoff point for an abortion. If it's your last chance to legally have an abortion, pro-choicers would argue that it would be a reasonable request to give those people the opportunity to have a buzzer shot abortion before they lose the opportunity forever. One other argument that's also emerging is, uh, this abortion ban might actually spread the pandemic. 
By foreclosing nearby options for medication abortions, the ban pushes anxious patients to fly or drive hundreds of miles across state lines to attempt to obtain abortion services. Travel as far away as Colorado and Georgia increases the risk of contracting or spreading the virus. Yeah, we really don't want preventable interstate travel during a period of stay-at-home orders. Now, in reading the arguments from both sides, one thing does become apparent. It seems that both sides seem to think Texas can legally do some form of an abortion ban under existing precedent. The question facing the Supreme Court will be, which shades of gray are reasonable and which shades of gray are just too dark? Thank you and that's all I have to say about that. Hello YouTube! First I'd like to thank my patrons for helping me put out my videos. If you want to support independent nonpartisan news looking into the overlooked, join this growing list of exceptional individuals by clicking on that link in the description. Also remember to subscribe and ring that bell so that freedom will continue to ring. Give me a thumbs up if you liked what you saw, and lastly, as always, thank you for watching.